morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I'm not sure you believe that. Let's try that again. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 We are here to give him our worship, to give him our love, to worship his name for he is worthy. Let's stand. Let's ask his blessing upon our service that we might worship him in spirit and truth. And we have come to hear from him as his word is preached. So let's pray that we have open and receptive hearts. Let's pray. Lord, you deserve all worship. You are the only one worthy. Lord, by your hand, everything exists. It is sustained. Lord, we're here this morning only because you have deemed to create today. And Lord, that you have sustained everything from the earth that orbits the sun, Lord, to everyone who arrived here safely. And so, Lord, we give you praise. We give you thanks. We're thankful for your spirit, Lord, that created in us something entirely new. As Jesus said, we were born again. And Lord, this is not of us. This is because you first loved us and you poured out your grace and mercy upon us. And if we simply put our faith and trust that Christ died for our sins on the cross, then Lord, we too can have eternal life. And so we pray this morning, Lord, if there's any who have not put their trust and faith in Christ, that today would be the day. We pray today, Lord, for believers, that, Lord, may we worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, often we come and we're distracted. And, Lord, we just pray that you would forgive us. Forgive us for not putting you first like we should. Forgive us, Lord, for not following your ways as we should. Lord, and teach us today. Speak to us, we pray. We pray that you would bless our fellowship, bless the preaching of your word, fill Pastor Mac with your spirit, Lord, and give us receptive and soft hearts, Lord, that as we hear your word and we understand it, Lord, we obey it. As you've said in your word through James, Lord, what is our faith if we have no works? Lord, you created us for good works. So, Lord, may we be receptive and may we obey that we can bring you glory as your son brought you glory and to that end we pray your blessing upon us this morning in your son's precious name amen with that remain standing for the reading of god's word beloved of the lord good morning i'll be reading from first thessalonians and you can read long But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see you all here this morning. It was just a blessing to have that uh, congregational singing part of our service. Um, As Brian mentioned earlier, a blessing to have those kids come up and sing. So... I think the ladies who helped organize that aren't in this room anymore. They won't even hear this. But thank you to those ladies who helped organize that. And, of course, thank you to everyone who just helped with our, our song, the song portion of our service, to our pianist and organist and uh, James for leading here with the guitar, to the sound guys in the back. Thank you. Um, it's just a blessing to be able to sing to our God together. We are going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 today. We're transitioning here right at the end of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, we'll go.
go from there to chapter 5, verse 2. Although there's a, there's a chapter break in this section, uh, these verses seem to go together well. Ephesians 4.31 through 5, verse 2. But before we read this morning, let me ask, have you ever caught yourself turning into your parents before? Maybe it's their mannerisms, the cadence of how they speak, a particular saying that they have, um, imitating their parenting style, their fashion choices, their behaviors. Sometimes this is an intentional choice. If you uh, think highly of your parents, maybe you want to copy their parenting style, something, uh, you know, something philosophical that they've done uh, in, for you when you were growing up. You're, maybe you, you think, I want to do that for my kids. Maybe I want to be like that. Maybe at other times, it just happens accidentally. And sometimes when that happens, it can be a little funny, maybe a little frightening uh, for those who never thought they would turn into their parents. In fact, there's a whole series of commercials from Progressive Insurance that poke fun at this very idea. Have you seen those commercials? There's uh, that guy who, you know, he's, he's looking at, there's pictures on the shelf of him when he used to be, um, you know, look youthful, out with his wife, and then you see him, and he's dressed like a dad, and he starts saying dad things like, oh, that's pretty nifty, and he's falling asleep on the couch, and uh, his wife bumps him, I'm awake, I'm awake, uh, and the tagline, of course, is progressive can't save you from becoming your parents, but they can save you money on insurance. Uh, well, this passage this morning, we might say, in a way, it's got a similar theme, becoming like our Heavenly Father, or imitating our Heavenly Father. Just like we, sometimes kids, tend to copy their parents or imitate them, our passage is going to use that illustration to tell us that we should want to be like our Father in Heaven. I just want to remind everyone the context of where this passage is, what we've been looking at the last few weeks. There's a continuation in our, in our passage this morning on the theme of spiritual renewal. Paul is describing this process from the inside out of using two selves, our old self and our new self. He's telling us to put off old self qualities and to put on new self qualities. And we've been looking really the last few weeks of what that looks like with specific qualities. Don't lie like the old self would, but instead speak the truth to your neighbor. Don't let corrupt speech rule your hearts and your lives, uh, but instead speak gracious words. There's putting off, uh, putting on. And now at the end of this section, we're really kind of zooming out to instead of just looking at individual behaviors, we're trying to get a big picture idea of what this old self garment or outfit looks like. And we're going to get a big principle for what it looks like to put on the new self that applies in many different situations. And that big self principle, uh, as we'll see, will teach us to imitate our Heavenly Father in the forgiving gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's read Ephesians 4, 31 through 5, 2. It says, and I'll be reading from the ESV, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's help as we seek to understand this passage this morning. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you so much for your word. I thank you for this passage. It challenges us, challenges us to put um, sinful ways, the old self qualities, put them behind us, and instead to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, imitating your character and walking in love. Help us drink deeply from just the truths of the gospel this morning and how it changes, changes us and has the power to transform our lives. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. The big idea for today's message is, in all of my lifestyle, I am to imitate God's character 
displayed in the forgiving gospel of Jesus Christ. In all of my lifestyle, I am to imitate God's character displayed in the forgiving gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll look first here at a uh, summary of the old self that Paul wants us to put away, walk through some of these old self qualities like we've been doing the last couple weeks. And we'll see the direction he points us for a cure. And then we're going to look at this big principle that Paul gives us, we, who we want to imitate, what that new self looks like. It looks like imitating a person, or rather two persons of the Trinity, God the Father and God the Son. And then finally, we'll circle back around to uh, specifically forgiveness, because that's a, a particularly challenging aspect of this passage. What is forgiveness? Out of, we're supposed to imitate God the Father and God the Son, their love in all of life, but we can narrow it down specifically here in this passage to forgiveness in verse 32. So let's start with looking at the old self here, and we'll see how Paul takes a look at the old self outfit and begins to point us towards a cure. Remember that in this section, we're now zooming out. We've been looking at the individual old self, new self qualities. Now we're zooming out to get a picture of the whole garment. You can think of it as in you're in the, when you're in the store, you're looking at a piece of clothing, maybe that you're considering buying. You'll, you'll look in close, maybe at the stitching, maybe feel the fabric, but you also want to hold it up as a whole, maybe put it on in front of a mirror so you can get a sense of the whole garment. And I think that's what Paul is doing here because he gives us a sense of the whole old self garment or outfit. He says in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. In the previous verses, again, it's just been one old self quality, like lying or corrupt speech or stealing. But now he's cramming a bunch of old self qualities together. We've got bitterness, wrath, and anger. These are three words that, like our English translation, seem to go together. They cover the spectrum of different types of sinful anger, just like the, the English translations kind of give a, you know, give a, a kind of point to the spectrum of the different types of anger that can rule our hearts from kind of a seething, quiet bitterness and resentment, holding a grudge against someone to intense and direct confrontational anger, uh, like fighting, all right? Bitterness, wrath, and anger kind of cover those different types of anger. And remember that Paul's already addressed anger once already in this passage, so he's kind of circling back around to it. And then you've got these two words, clamor and slander. These words also seem to go together. They are the verbal component of what anger gives birth to when it rules our hearts. We begin fighting with one another, slandering them. All right, these are sinful speech patterns that naturally, the bitterness, wrath, and anger naturally give rise to, right? Clamor refers to words of direct confrontation. And one commentator even translates it yelling. And slander is any kind of malicious or cutting words spoken to someone directly or behind their back. All right, we've already, again, like, uh, like with anger, we've already seen this come up before in this section with, I think, under the heading of corrupting talk. Verse 29 says, let no corrupting talk. So I think Paul is bundling all these words together just to say any old self pattern, whether it's sinful speech or anger, uh, words, fighting, whatever comes up in you and through you, put it off, put it away. And he's slammed these five words together. And then kind of as an afterthought here in verse 31, he says, along with all malice. So that word malice is kind of the cherry thrown on top of this Sunday of the old self. And I think as I looked at this word in the original language, I found that it is a general word that refers to, that can refer to vice or evil or just evil intentions generally. So it seems that together, these, wor uh, these words, again, paint a picture of the summary of the old self and what it looks like when we let it reign in our hearts. How does this old self show up in our lives and in our hearts? Well, in the home, could look like several different things. A sarcastic response given to a spouse's request to do a chore or help with a need. Maybe it's a belittling comment 
made to uh, a son, a daughter, a father, a mother, a spouse about something that they've done, slamming a door in anger to end a conversation. That's where this malice, this evil intent can show up in the home. Maybe it can show up in all kinds of places. It can show up in the workplace, a passive aggressive email response, right? Meant to call someone else out, raising your voice in a meeting, dressing down an employee, talking about your boss behind their back. In the church, the old self can show up. We're supposed to be bearing with one another in love, right? Serving one another as Christ himself washed the disciples' feet. He says that's what the church should look like, but instead, unfortunately, sometimes the old self pattern of anger, bitterness, clamor, slander, unfortunately, that tends to sometimes reign in the church when we point out each other's weaknesses, belittling them, perhaps gossiping about them. When we disagree with someone and we, instead of doing it amicably and appropriately, we let it turn into a fight or talking about people behind their back. We don't follow Matthew 18's principles for handling sin and conflict quickly. We let it fester. We let it boil over. That's where these malicious attitudes um, and actions and words can show up in our lives. You know, the way Paul has put all these words together at the end of this paragraph, it reminds me just how commonly old self qualities tend to come together in packs. Have you ever noticed that? Very often, when we have a bad attitude towards someone in our lives, uh, we can't, uh, it quickly blossoms and balloons into bringing on a lot of different old self qualities and actions along with it. That attitude will, maybe it starts off kind of subtly manifesting itself and just kind of a frustration, a bad attitude. It starts with something small, and we just dismiss it as, oh, I don't like that person, or that person frustrates me. But pretty soon, if we sit on it, we, we notice that it turns into bitterness. And then all of a sudden, from bitterness, we've noticed that we've talked about that person behind their back, or we've said something nasty to them, right? Old self qualities, unfortunately, when left unchecked, tend to come in packs. If you let yourself put on the sleeve of the old self garment, pretty soon you've noticed you're wearing the whole outfit, unfortunately. And how quickly it happens often that anger, slander, fighting, these kind of old self qualities escalate, right? A little bit of slander can turn into a, ta into a tornado of backbiting and drama. How quickly an angry action or word can turn into a firestorm of bitterness and wrath. A little malice, a little evil intent, willingness to harm someone for your own good can turn into a lot of bad if left unchecked. So understandably, like the last of the old self, Paul says, get it away, put it off. And as we reach, as we start to build a composite picture of this old self garment and what it looks like, I love this section because with each aspect of the old self that's come previously in verses 25 through 30, Paul's given us, he's told us to put it off and he's given us a reason to do it. For instance, with the thief stealing, he says, don't do it, put it off and instead do honest work so that you can share, replacing the old self with a bit of the new self. Well, here when we come to this big picture, zoomed out, um, zoomed out view of the old self, I think Paul also points us to an important, big summary principle for how we can fight the old self, uh, whatever it looks like in our lives. He points us to the forgiving gospel of Jesus Christ. We need a medicine, a cure-all for, for the old self and our lives. And there are many different reasons to fight against the old self and in the Bible. Don't give a foothold to the devil. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Those are some of the reasons that have come before. But I think the greatest, awesomest, simplest, and yes, yet most profound cure-all for every evil intention that arises in, it rises in our hearts is the gospel message. Go back to the forgiveness that's found 
in the gospel. That's what verse 32 points us towards. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as or just as God in Christ forgave you. That's the gospel message. We've been forgiven through Jesus Christ. God the Father sent God the Son to die on a cross for our sins so that we might be forgiven. Verse 32, chapter 4, verse 32, mentions the gospel really in summary form as God in Christ forgave you. And then in chapter 5, verse 2, also once again reminds us of the gospel of forgiveness. It says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. There, there it is, the good news of Jesus Christ. He loved us and he gave himself for us to die on a cross for our sins, rose again so that we might be forgiven from our sin. The best cures for sickness are cure-alls, right? One medicine that can handle many symptoms. And this might seem like a silly illustration here. I realize I'm comparing the gospel to, um, to uh, you know, physical medicine. But have you ever seen the commercials for Pepto-Bismol and their marketing line? Do you remember it? It's a silly song that, <laughs> that once you start getting it in your head, you can't get it out. So I won't repeat it here. But they, uh, it's nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea, right? And their whole thing is one medicine for all those symptoms. If I could use that as a silly illustration, I think what Paul is doing here is saying bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice, all of it. Go back to the medicine of the gospel and what we see about God's character there. One way of paraphrasing, I think, verse, uh, verses 31 and 32. Any desire you have to get back at someone, to hurt someone, to take advantage, whether with your attitude, your tongue, your actions, whatever it is, there's a cure-all that works for each of them. Gospel, God's gospel forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I use that word gospel, and I expect that many people here who uh, may be familiar with that word, if you've been a Christian for, for years, if you, uh, if you yourself have believed in the gospel, the good news of Jesus, it's the basic and main message of the Christian faith. You might think of it as the ABCs of Christianity, what you have to learn in order to become a Christian in the first place, right? But... Uh, I expect that many people will be familiar with it, but let me just repeat it here uh, you know, basic, in a basic way. It, you can never repeat it too often in the church. We don't want to just assume that people know the gospel, the good news, right? The gospel is that God is the perfect creator, king of the universe over me, over you, over everyone. But we learn from the Bible story soon after the beginning, after God created everything good, Mankind has sinned against this perfect God. And now, even though we weren't there when sin entered the world, sin, in the words of Romans 5, reigns. It rules over the whole creation uh, in a significant way, especially over us. We are born sinners, and we choose to sin against God, all of us. We sometimes don't think it's a big deal, but the Bible says we've all rebelled against our good creator God. And because of that sin, we deserve consequences. We deserve death. And Jesus warns that part of this punishment, uh, death is not just physical death, but a spiritual death in a place of eternal punishment called hell. And I don't say that lightly. Um, that's part of the reality that, that God wants us to be aware of in the gospel We've sinned against God. We deserve death and hell. But God loved sinners like you and like me. He loved this lost and broken world and planned to save us. And this plan included an, uh, across the Old Testament making promises to people to redeem them, to save them, and to make a people for himself. And eventually, at the right time, this plan included sending his son Jesus into the world to live a perfect life, die a death on the cross that we deserve, but that he took in our place and then rise again from the grave so that we can be completely forgiven from our sins. 
I hope this overview is, will be familiar to many, but again, it's, we cannot repeat it often enough, too often uh, in the church. This is, as we sang earlier, there is one gospel uh, for, that is our hope and life and death, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is a medicine in more ways than one for the old self garment. One, it forgives our sin. And what a foundational truth. Anytime we have sinful patterns come up in our lives, and they do, even after we become Christians, anytime there's malice, evil intent against someone, we, we find ourselves struggling with the old man, the old self, we can go back to the gospel, which reminds us that we have full and complete and free forgiveness through Jesus. As the old hymn says, Jesus paid it all. Um, he took it all on the cross. So if we ever find ourselves, when struggling with the old, old self in particular, to be weighed down by guilt, go back to the forgiveness that is given to us through the cross of Christ. That fundamental reality is a game changer for struggling with sin in our lives. Christians don't struggle against sin from a perspective of needing to win the victory in order to be forgiven, in order to deserve heaven, in order to work their way into God's favor. That's already been done. God has done that for us through Jesus on the cross. So that's part of the way that the gospel is a medicine for old self patterns. And another way in which the gospel is a medicine here perhaps a, a big principle that we should pay attention to that we already mentioned in the opening to this message is that the gospel not only forgives us, it gives us an example to imitate. It shows us how just how God forgave us when we were in sin, we have a, an example of God's forgiveness that we can use to combat, to f fight against old self patterns. Just as Jesus loved us, in the gospel, we have a pattern to love one another. Just as God, the Father, is per perfect and holy in every situation and righteous, we have a pattern to follow. That is part of the, what is going to be the focus for the rest of this message. The gospel not only forgives us, it gives us an example, or in the case here, examples, two persons of the Trinity, God the Father and God the Son, their holiness, righteousness, forgiveness, and love to imitate. So let's move on to this general principle that we have here where Paul tells us, he starts in verse 32 by saying, as God and Christ forgave you, you're supposed to follow that example and forgive other people. And then he moves on in chapter 5 to elaborating on this, giving a big principle saying, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitate God, be like him, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So in response to the old man, Paul is telling us, imitate the father's gospel forgiveness and the son's love in every situation. Let's start with imitating God's character. That's a big principle that I think applies uh, very generally to the Christian life and can give us a lot uh, to sink our teeth into there. To, let's meditate on that. What does it look like to imitate God's character, to be an imitator of God? All right. Well, first off, let's clarify something. There's a specific ways in which we are supposed to imitate God and some ways in which we cannot imitate him. Uh, we are supposed to imitate him in his character, that is his holiness, righteousness, his moral perfection, all right? And thankfully, just to clarify, we cannot and should not try to imitate him in every way. In fact, you may remember that Adam and Eve in the garden, they wanted to be imitators of God in a way that God had not ordained. <laughs> they wanted to rule, to take his crown. They wanted to be like him in a way that was not uh, appropriate. We, uh, God does not expect us to imitate him in his perfect, vast knowledge of the universe, okay? We cannot do that. That's something that God alone uh, 
has the prerogative to do. He knows when Christ is coming again. He knows how many atoms are in the universe. Uh, we certainly do not need to imitate his knowledge uh, and his perfect knowledge in that way. All right, we cannot imitate his position of being judge over the whole earth and dishing out justice and vengeance in a way that he deems is appropriate, okay? God, in fact, tells us, uh, I've got that. You don't need to take care of that. He says, uh, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Thank the Lord that that's in his hands and not in mine or in yours, okay? However, like we said, we are to imitate him generally in his holy and righteous character in every situation. In fact, going back to Ephesians 4, verse 24, it says as much. It says, uh, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is a big principle that just doesn't just show up here in the book of Ephesians. Way back in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 19.2 says, uh, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. We have it in the Old Testament. We have it, uh, Jesus, in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5.43. Uh, um, and then going on to verse 30, 48, I won't read this whole section, but just highlight here. He, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Verse 48 then says, be perfect, or holy, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we want to be perfect, holy, righteous as God is holy. We want to imitate him in that way. Let's try to, to bring this down out of the, the kind of a up here principles and bring it down to real life, what that could look like in our lives. How about loving your enemy? When we see someone who has wronged us, someone who we have a bad relationship with, someone who hates us, someone who feels like maybe it feels like they're gunning for us, they have it out for us. What, we might not use the word enemy, maybe we would. But someone who we find ourselves at odds with, um, our natural reaction is to push back. Someone pushes you, me, me on the playground, I'm going to push them back. Someone comes at me with a nasty email, well, boy, I'm going to go around and I'm going to talk to the boss or I'm going to you know, take it into my own hands. That's not our Heavenly Father's character. God, the Father, even when we were his enemies, set his love on us sent the Son to die for us. The Father loves even sinners, even those who were once his enemies. Here's another quality besides loving your enemy, being slow to anger. This is one of the Father's qualities that we can imitate ourselves. When we're in a situation where the natural human response is anger of some kind, backbiting, yelling, slander, we can remember our God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Exodus 34, 6. Telling the truth. Our Father himself, he asks us to tell the truth. He's consistent with his own commands, his own law. And one of those commands, not bearing false witness or lying, is something that he himself always does perfect, perfectly. Hebrews 6, 18 tells us that he always keeps his promises. God can never lie. Can you imagine the chaos if our God lied to us? If he said something in his word that wasn't true? We almost take it for granted. Yeah, we can trust our God. God never tells lies. What he promises, he will deliver. These, and, we, and the list could go on and on. Ways in which God's perfect character, we can make our own. When it comes to imitating the Father... We made the, the, uh, the point back in the beginning, in our opening illustration, that uh, sometimes it's accidental when we become like our human fathers. We just find ourselves one day repeating phrases that he said, or maybe if it's our mom, we find ourselves just all of a sudden adap adapting her mannerisms without even thinking about it. But here, notice that this is not something that's accidental. 
it's a command. We're commanded to be imitate, uh, imitators of God. This is an active command, which implies this is something that we should be intentionally, actively looking to understand and develop in our lives uh, more deeply. If we revert to kind of being passive in the Christian life, the old self tends to reestablish dominance in our lives. Becoming like the Father happens intentionally as we spend time with Him, as we study His Word, and as we seek to understand His character more deeply. Which, by the way, reminds us that the study of God, theology, sometimes what we uh, will call it, is transformational. It's good for our lives. Uh, James and I just went to an ordination for a young man who at Berlin Baptist Church on Thursday. It was really a cool um, opportunity to be there where there are a number of pastors from our area who were just part of uh, this young man's journey of becoming a pastor. There was uh, a period of asking him uh, doctrinal questions about his own theology. It was uh, cool to be a part of, really enjoyed it. And, you know, I told James when we were there, and that it was certainly the case that this ordination process was not intended just to stump this young man and bring out the most obscure pieces of theology, like saying, like quizzing this young man, how many angels can stand on the head of a pen, okay? <laughs> Sometimes people think of theology that way. They think of, oh man, it's just boring and just obscure, asking these far out there, uh, way out in left field um, questions about God that really have no meat or meaning for life. If we understand our God rightly, then everything we learn about him should give us a greater awe and grandeur of who he is leading to worship and should help us transform our lives and our hearts. When I see God's faithfulness in the pages of scripture, my, it should open my heart to worship. Learning about him, his perfect character, um, what he's done for us through the gospel should change me. Theology is good for life. Don't don't think your theology or your knowledge of God is something that you just kind of have back in a closet somewhere that's gathering cobwebs. No, it is good for all of life. When, especially here, as it's presented, we know him in order to imitate him. And notice in this uh, verse, Ephesians 5.1, tells us to be an imitator of God as beloved children which I think implies that we have particularly here, uh, we want to be, imitate God, our Trinitarian God, Father, Son, Spirit, but probably in this passage in particular, God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, is especially in view because we're dealing with our Father-Son relationship to him. Going back to Ephesians 1, um, as Paul just is there unfolding some of the gospel basics for his readers, he does remind us of our father-son relationship to God. Ephesians chapter 1, all the way back to chapter 1, verse 5, we are told he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. We should want to be like him because he's adopted us, and we can call him father. Now, I don't know how that comes across to those in this room, that idea of looking to God as Father and wanting to be like Him. Um, there's a chance that that will resonate with many. Wow, I, just like I want to be like my human father, how much more should I want to be like God, my heavenly Father? Uh, it crosses my mind that there may be some people in here who that analogy doesn't resonate with as deeply, perhaps because of a painful relationship or lack of relationship with your human father. So I want to remind us, if that's the case with you, if you had an absent father, a moral, moral failure of a father, or maybe even a violent or abusive father, remember that God in his fatherhood is perfect. And he is a father to the fatherless. 
He is a good father um, regardless of how good your human father was. And that's part of the beauty of this command to imitate our heavenly father is that as we get to know him, sometimes we can project human failings onto God. You know, when you hear about God as a father, we, we might think of an overbearing father, a father who loses his temper or whatever else. But as we get to know God more, we will find we can trust him more because he is perfect in every way. He doesn't choose favorites. He doesn't lose his temper. He hasn't ever neglected his own, hasn't abandoned us. He's always, he's always there for those who call on him. He never disciplines too harshly. He's always good. So we can imitate God, our heavenly father. Now, we're just now getting to imitating Christ and his love and uh, bringing it back around to, I think, one of the, the major uh, applications of this whole passage is forgiveness. I think that's a, a big enough thing. I'd like to go ahead and uh, in here and save forgiveness for next week. I think there's enough there that we can come back to that theme because I don't want to be rushing through it here as we get to the end. We've seen that we are supposed to, in response to the old self garment, we are supposed to be imitators of God, our Heavenly Father, and His gospel forgiveness in everything. You know, um, I'm going to use an odd illustration to close here. Uh, celebrities and celebrity culture here in the United States can often be quite strange, all right? The world of Hollywood, and I don't off, wouldn't often go there for uh, just to, to use an illustration, but I think um, this kind of fits to maybe be a, a punchy ending for our message today. Have you ever seen on the red carpet, if you've ever watched the Oscars, which I'm not suggesting or recommending necessarily, okay? It's not particularly the most wholesome thing, but if, if you're slightly familiar with that world, strange as it may be, have you ever heard the interviewer on the red, red carpet, instead of what are you wearing, they'll say something a little different. They'll say, who are you wearing? Ever heard that? You know, Joan Rivers or whoever it is, you know. Um, just, it just kind of speaks to how strange Hollywood can be sometimes, right? It's its own separate world. They say that because, you know, these celebrities, part of what they're doing is, uh, you know, these big designers pay them or, you know, have give them these... Uh, you know, extravagant dresses and suits and outfits that are thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, uh, designers that you and I would never wear, right? You know, like the fancy designers from Italy or something, Gucci, right? Um, I'll, I'll never own something like that, <laughs> unless you guys want to give me uh, a nice handbag. I can, no, okay. Who are you wearing? A strange question. But as we look at Ephesians 4 and 5, it strikes me there might be one other place besides the red carpet where that actually makes sense. For the Christian, yes, it's, we can ask ourselves, uh, when it comes to the old self and the new self, what am I wearing? Am I wearing lying, corrupt talk, stealing, wrath, anger, bitterness? Or am I wearing the new self in its place? But as we zoom out and get a whole picture, I think the question, who are you wearing, makes just as much sense. Because really, when it comes down to it, that's what the Christian uh, should be putting on. Not just a random list of good things, but we should be imitating God the Father and Christ the Son. So next time you walk by uh, on the checkout at the grocery store and you see you know, the gossip magazines about ce celebrity culture, maybe you can take something silly and connect it to something profound in the scripture. Who are you wearing? And all of my lifestyle, I am to imitate God's character displayed in the forgiving gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. We love you. We worship you. And we've learned from this passage that we should want to be like you, imitating your character in all our interactions with one another. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.